Hey there, boys and girls. This is Josh from TutorMedical.com. Today I'm going to be taking you guys through our blog post on chest pain. We have another blog post dedicated to the five steps to success on every code blue, so I'm going to briefly touch on those again here. First step, IV. Everybody needs an IV. If they don't have vascular access, you need to address that. Oxygen, I don't care how you do it, but maintain an O2 sat greater than or equal to 94%. If you cannot get an O2 sac greater than or equal to 94%, you should be considering more aggressive means. As far as a monitor, every patient that comes into the hospital or at your bedside, especially complaining of chest pain, should be getting a 3, 4, 5, 6 lead, depending on your unit. And we should be greatly considering getting a 12 lead. But every single patient needs some type of regular EKG monitoring. For vital signs, get a basic set of vital signs. Our PR bells is a standard set, which we've talked about in a previous blog. And then as far as our 12 lead, when we start talking about chest pain, we're looking at our 12 lead because chest pain, 12 lead, the next thing that should come into your head, the ST segment. And we'll talk about that later on. But ST segment elevation or depression is going to tell me what's going on inside this patient's chest and how we're going to go about treating it. Now, when we start talking about chest pain specifically, there's a couple ways for us to differentiate between angina and an MI. And a lot of that's going to come down to these basic uh, assessment questions. The first question we always want to ask is onset. Did the pain come on fast or slow? Do not confuse onset with time. What time did the pain start? Those are two very different questions. When we ask time, it's imperative that we ask what time did the pain start. Onset is did it come on fast or slow? So if you said the pain started at noon and it's one o'clock, I want to know at noon, was this a light switch that all of a sudden snap of the fingers went from zero out of 10 to 10 out of 10? Or has this been creeping up for the last hour, gradually increasing in pain? Was this sudden or gradual, fast or slow? That's what we're looking for, for onset. A heart attack is a clot. That's going to come on all of a sudden. Angina is vasospasm causing an occlusion, causing that ischemic heart. That's going to be a slower onset. As far as provocation and palliation, some books will harp on one, not the other. I'm a big fan of asking both. It's strange to me to ask somebody does what makes the pain better and not ask what makes the pain worse. So when we start talking about provocation, you want to ask what were you doing when the pain started? That's going to t tell me a little bit more about the story. If my guy was running wind sprints and he was going up and down the hills and all of a sudden he had chest pain, I'm thinking more angina. If my patient just got off a long flight from, to America from China and he didn't stand up for 20 hours, I'm thinking more MI because that guy's just building clots. Palliation is only supposed to be does it make the pain worse or what makes the pain worse. You're going to ask that, ask what makes it better. It's going to give you both sides of that coin. So provocation, what were you doing? Palliation, anything make the pain better or worse. If they took a nitro and they got relief, this is not an MI. Nitrates do not fix a clot. Nitrates only cause a slight vasos uh, vasodilation, which will counteract the vasospasm, which is causing our angina. As far as quality, this is imperative that we ask this in your own words, describe the pain to me. If we don't ask it like that, if we say, is the pain sharp or dull? 100% of the time, your patient will reply with, it's a sharp, dull pain. Is it hot or cold? It's like a burning, freezing feeling. And that's not really what we want to get from our patients. So that's imperative. We want to make sure that we have an understanding of what their pain feels like to them without us somehow tainting that answer. As far as region, radiation, and reoccurrence, I always want to make sure for region I have them point with one finger. A broad hand sweep across their chest doesn't really give us very much information. If they start pointing to their right lower chest, I'm not thinking MI. If they're pointing substernal, middle of their chest, MI, angina starts to become a bigger factor. As far as radiation, does the pain move anywhere? With that same finger that I just had them point with, I generally will draw a picture on my chest to give them the idea, did that pain move anywhere? Because remember, if you're watching this, or if you're listening to this, or if you're reading this, you're a nerd. You've been spending time learning about cardiac. You've been learning about medicine in, in some extent. 
But when we start talking about radiation, the electronics technician, the guy that works at Walmart, hears radiation, they think nuclear bombs. They think nuclear waste. So if you say radiation, they're like, no, 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 no. We're, we run a clean job site. We always clean that stuff up. So people don't usually use the word radiation for movement like we do. And as far as reoccurrence, um, there's two types of reoccurrence. There's ongoing, and then there's, there's like acute, and there's chronic. So did, has this ever happened before would be reoccurrence. And is the pain coming and going? Or is it a constant feeling? It would be more of an acute recurrence. Ask all three of these. So O, P, Q, R, R, R. And then we jump down here to our S. Pretty straightforward. Give me, a, give me a number. On a scale from 0 to 10, on a scale from 1 to 10. If they tell me their pain is a 0, but they called me for chest pain, we're going to have some issues. Um, as far as time, what time did the pain start? Make sure you guys don't ask how long ago did the pain start. I want an actual time because we get into this habit of just repeating back what they say. So if they say the pain started about an hour ago, but it took us 20 minutes to get there and we just pair it back with dispatch told us and then we're on scene for 20 minutes and then we make our radio report to the hospital and then we do a 30 minute drive, all of that is going to be telling us the same thing about an hour ago, about 20 minutes ago, about 30 minutes ago. And all of that can now cause us to have some issues. As far as interventions, this is a crazy one. What have you done to help the pain? Because I actually went to a patient's house. I walked in the door. I tried to give them aspirin, and they said, no, it's okay. I took a Tylenol before you got here. Good that your knee doesn't swell up mid-heart attack. Bad because it's the wrong drug. Remember, patients aren't doctors. Patients aren't nurses. When somebody has a headache, they take an ibuprofen, an aspirin, a Tylenol. They use them interchangeably, but they're different drugs. As far as treatments, pretty straightforward. We always heard the old mnemonic Mona, but we don't start off with our narcotics. So our first one is oxygen. We're going to be treating the mnemonic Onum. So our first is oxygen. Oxygen should already be addressed up here, but we want to go back and readdress it and make sure that's still good from where we messed with it before. If we need to adjust or change, do whatever we need to do to maintain that O2 side greater than or equal to 94%. We're not shooting for a high score of 100 because again, oxygen can actually have some vasoconstriction properties and that's going to work against our next couple drugs. As far as aspirin, standard dosing is anywhere between 160 and 325 milligrams PO. Don't ever tell me that aspirin's a blood thinner. Aspirin is not a blood thinner. Aspirin is an antiplatelet. It's a platelet aggregate inhibitor. The way I always describe it to my EMT students is that uh, imagine a dirty pan sitting in your, uh, in your sink, a bunch of food stuck to it. Aspirin is preventative. Aspirin is like rewind the clock 30 minutes, spraying that pan with cooking spray, putting some oil in the pan, that's going to prevent the mess from happening or prevent the mess from getting worse. When you say blood thinner, I'm thinking Dawn dish soap. I'm thinking heparin. I'm thinking warfarin. I'm thinking the actual blood thinner that's going to go in and break down the clots. Aspirin doesn't break down clots. Aspirin prevents the clots from growing. So common misconception there, pet peeve of mine. As far as nitroglycerin, there's a couple different ways of giving nitroglycerin. Uh, first is sublingual, it's one we generally will see. That's going to be 0 0.4 milligrams spray or 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 milligrams tablet. Not a huge deal. Most people don't realize there's a difference, but this 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 means that if I'm six doses into my nitro, I can actually have a pretty profound amount. I'm almost a full milligram off by going with 0 0.3 versus 0 0.4. Not a huge deal. It gets into how the medication is actually made. In the machines, the tablets can't be formed as precisely as the 400 micrograms per spray. Transdermal is going to be roughly 15 milligrams or so of nitrates. Uh, for transdermal paste, um, you just put the, pa uh, the paste on the patch and place it on the chest. And as far as intravenous, this is going to be ICU only. Uh, you might start this in an ER setting, um, but that patient is an ICU patient just waiting for a bed. Uh, the problem with intravenous nitrates is that uh, if you mess it up, it's really hard to undo what you just did. So you ought to have a lot of pressure standing by and ready to use. And as far as contraindications, it's imperative that we're asking these to our patients before we give nitrates, not after they become dizzy and throw up. A big one we have to ask boys and girls. 
men and women, take Viagra, Vivitra, Cialis, or any of the other types, depending on the year and what's now the new brand name of choice. But men and women do use these, and sometimes they're administered off-label, sometimes they're used for their, intense, uh, their intended purpose. Another thing to consider is pulmonary hypertension meds. These are the same drug. Erectile dysfunction medications and pulmonary hypertension medications are the same drug. It's just the marketing and some subtleties on the nerd level that have made them different. So they found erectile dysfunction medications by learning and trying to develop pulmonary hypertension medications, and they found they had a cute little side effect. And they marketed that, and it made them a lot more money. As far as the blood pressure less than 90, nitrates are going to drop your blood pressure. So if I already have a garbage pressure down into the 70s and 80s, I might want to be very cautious, if not completely withhold nitrates, because I don't have a lot of wiggle room there. If I have a blood pressure that's less than 90, I'm going to hold off on it. Or if I have these, I'm going to hold off on it. A good rule of thumb is that for erectile dysfunction medications or pulmonary hypertension medications, my blood pressure can drop 50 to 70 points from administering one dose of nitrates. So if my blood pressure was already 100 and I dropped that blood pressure 70 points, I now just committed negligent homicide. So that's generally frowned upon. And as far as the right side of MI, um, this is the one nobody ever really talks about, but the big problem here is that if we ever see ST elevation in 2-3 AVF, um, that's going to tell us that it's going to be an inferior wall MI, which is also a right side. Uh, as far as a right side, if we actually do run a proper right side of 12 lead, then I'll have another blog post about right side of 12 leads and how to interpret them. But if we have a right side of MI, we want to hold off on it because it's going to completely knock out the preload of the heart, dumping the blood pressure, and end up uh, with a negative outcome for our patients. And as far as morphine, Morphine is there to help our patients out. It's there as a narcotic. It does a little bit of venous pooling and a little bit of blood pressure stuff, but the biggest thing that morphine does is it's an analgesic. It gets the patient high. If our patients are no longer in pain or they don't care about the pain, the overall cardiac workload is going to decrease exponentially. It's great that it has a little venous pooling and it's great that there's some blood pressure changes, but that's not why I give it. I give it because I've given my nitro three, four, five times, and it hasn't helped the pain. That means it's a clot. I don't have clot busters in my ambulance. Most ERs aren't going to be giving thrombolytics. So you have to go someplace for that specifically, and they want to run tests, and they want to get them on angioplasty, and they want to see these different things. But till they get there, let's make that heart work a little bit less, and let's give them some morphine. Again, be careful with blood pressures, be careful with respiratory rates, be careful with other comorbidities that might become a factor. Always ask before you give nitrates, or before you give narcotics, I'm sorry, to patients, because some patients are recovering addicts, and it can lead to issues, but we're not talking about that. Just give morphine. Just give it. It's going to decrease the workload, it's going to make them feel better, and it's slow IV push. If you slam morphine, your patients will become nauseous. That's why most patients are usually given the piggyback of Zofran right after their morphine. They'll slam a morphine, slam a Zofran, and go to their next patient. The problem with that is Zofran has some negative cardiac effects. In high doses, in the wrong patient, Zofran can actually kill somebody cardiac uh, with cardiac abnormalities. What was our patient's problem again? Oh yeah, chest pain. So maybe we should be careful with that heart. That's all I have for you guys today. Just a quick little overview of our blog post on chest pain. Please feel free to go to tulumedical.com, look through our blogs. We have multiple posts up and more coming every week. Um, there will be more videos of my ugly mug in front of the camera, but for now, this is all I got for you. Hope you guys have a great day. See you later.